Any last community? Okay, so I'd like to welcome uh, John, GM4SJB, to Denby Dale Amateur Radio Club. Uh, our first ever talk on operating radio at um, long wave and medium wave frequencies. There are two allocations to UK amateurs. Um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to your, your contribution tonight, John, and also to tales of exactly how big that antenna is that you use on those uh, those frequencies so john over to you okay well, thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me along to uh, to, to talk about this uh, i can blame kevin and um, he saw the talk i gave it to one of the, the clubs up in the highlands here uh, despite my accent and i live in the, the north of scotland so <laughs> the, the accent actually tells you where i'm really from but that's another story uh, so uh, it was kevin's a, uh, the, the guy to blame for this but uh, more than happy to, to run through. Um, but my background is mechanical engineering. Um, so this is very much a, a station put together for somebody who has a hobby level of, of electronics, which has been gained over the, the 40 odd years as an amateur. And uh, I don't have a professional background. So it's, it's doable by anybody. <laughs> so um, I'll just hopefully we'll, we'll click the right bits here and we'll just uh, share, share the screen and I'll, I'll run through the presentation here. Uh, you can just confirm Nick, that this is coming up. Um, that doesn't look right. Now we've got nothing yet. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. We need to go. I have too many screens going here. <laughs> right. Let's see. Try that one. We should be a title screen that says Life Between the Broadcast. Yes, there is. Yeah, we've got okay, that. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's, we've got the right screen. You don't have a screen with all my notes on it, sure you don't? No, we don't. No, <laughs> no, no, right. That's even better. Okay. Right. Well, the, um, the 630 meter band, it lies um, just between the medium wave and the long wave broadcast band, uh, 630 meters, uh, which is 472 kilohertz. Um, I'll just very quickly go back to where I started with, with the long wave bands. Um, I was as a, as a teenager, in fact, probably before a teenager, I became aware of Radio Luxembourg and Radio North Sea International and uh, Radio Caroline was just about reachable in Northern Ireland. Um, Radio Scotland would have been the big pirate station we would have got uh, because it was anchored just off the county down coast. So it was quite a strong signal back in the 1960s. And that was when I was sort of just becoming aware that there was radio stations and that different radio stations did different things. So we weren't on it for a few years until I became an impressionable teenager. And uh, somebody gave me a small pocket size transistor radio and uh, all of a sudden I had my own radio to listen to my own stuff. But by that stage I had become a bit interested in electronics so with one thing and another I ended up um, purchasing after paper rounds and lots of car washing and so on uh, an HAC one valve kit <laughs> and I believe HAC stood for here all continents so uh, that ran off a 90 volt ever ready drive battery uh, so that was put together and uh, I sort of embarked on my um, lifelong interest of, of, of radio uh, as a more serious listener and uh, the first KSL card was Radio Moscow uh, which we received on the, the HAC receiver and I thought it was every bit the boy. Um, so wind on a lot of years, you know, we got the license, we'll, we'll get married, kids came along and the radio sort of came and went just depending on the different lifetime uh, experiences and I think say a few years ago, settled in Scotland here, the kids are grown up Bit more time for the radio and uh, I sort of reawoke my interest in the, uh, the lower bands starting first of all just with sort of medium wave um, long distance as you could call it DXing and experimenting with long wire antennas and so on uh, and then the, I realized that there was two amateur allocations which had become available um, back in the early 2000s and uh, I thought right we want to get onto one of those bands so um, I started listening a bit more seriously on those two bands and uh, my interest uh, has gone more and more towards 630 metres, mainly, I think, because <laughs> whilst the antennas are big, um, they're actually achievable in, in constructing something that will radiate a signal on that band uh, without having access to a large amount of land and uh, towers and bits and pieces and so on, which probably will be needed uh, to, to get a, a reasonably. Um, when I say efficient, uh, even at 630, efficiency is not the, uh, the right word for it, probably, because the antenna is very inefficient, but uh, at least it does radiate. Right, I'll uh, move on to some more interesting screens here. If I can get the, the right screen to advance my... Uh, right, I need too, too many buttons on the computer, sorry. Bear with me here a second. 
I'm trying to work out what's happening. Right, there we go. That's um, just where you'll find the, uh, the 630 meter band. That's the radio spectrum from VLF right up to EHF. Uh, you can see the sweet spot, which is where the, the big demand is nowadays. That's sort of from the top end of the VHF, uh, part of the spectrum through UHF and up into SHF. A lot of demand for mobiles, uh, satellite stuff, TV, media, a lot. And uh, as a result of all of that, there's actually some of the frequencies lower down the spectrum have become less used. And uh, the wee bit where we're at, uh, the medium frequency band between the, the long wave and medium wave, that was used traditionally for the maritime service and uh, there was rescue frequencies and things like that. So most of that now takes place on, uh, on satellite or VHF, um, which is probably one of the reasons why we find ourselves um, down where we are. And, and negotiations were carried out uh, at a number of world radio conferences over the years to, to, to get the allocation that we're at. I'll run quickly through those in a moment or two. So, so that's just that diagram just shows where we are. It's a shared band with secondary status. And uh, unfortunately, it's only available to full license holders at the moment. And the maximum permitted power is five watts. <laughs> this is not an awful lot. And uh, that's EIRP. Uh, up until about maybe a year ago, a lot of people didn't really um, take much interest in what EIRP was. It's a wee bit different from ERP, um, which is probably a bit different again from what actually comes out of the back of the set. But I think everybody is now well aware of what EIRP is with the, uh, the EMF um, regulations, which are, are slowly being introduced. Uh, so we'll just move on now to the next screen. This is just a brief history. As I'll just run uh, more or less read through this and add a couple of wee bits. Um, for many decades, the, the lowest band which we had was, was top band, which I always thought was a bit of a misnomer, but you know, it's, 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 it's high in wavelength and low in frequency. So uh, I suppose that's why it's, it's come to be known as top band, but that was one point, what well, is 1.8 megahertz. That changed in 1997. Um, when the, uh, the CEPT recommendation gave radio amateurs access to the, 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 the lowest of the low bands, that's 2200 metres, that's uh, so 135, 136 kilohertz, that sort of frequency. Uh, and some years later then, there was a suggestion made to fill that gap between the 220 metre band and top band. And uh, the frequencies in and around 500 kilohertz were the, the ones that were sort of being looked at because it fitted in between the two broadcast band Bands, and uh, it also was, was having less use in the commercial world. Uh, so in 2005, then a few German hams obtained experimental licenses. They began with the DI2 call sign, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't actually allow two-way communication. So most of the activity um, back then was just with beacons on the band, but that gave an insight as, as to what was likely to be seen and heard, and uh, obviously uh, fueled a, a wee bit of interest too. Uh, probably mostly in, in, in and around Germany, I would imagine, and uh, people who maybe would have had, co had contacts in, in nearby countries. And, but the nature of the, the, the lower frequency bands, they're very much um, nighttime bands for any sort of DX. Uh, normally during the day, you're, you're going to get ground wave, which is uh, what you get on your, <laughs> your, your, your AM radio in the car and so on. You, you, you sort of know what the, the range is likely to be. So moving on then, in 2006, a number of USA and Canadian stations also received experimental licenses. Uh, they're in the 465 to 515 kilohertz frequency range. So you can see that the ranges are sort of the, the, the moved about a wee bit just depending on the, which country was involved and uh, also the, 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 the time uh, range. So 495 to 505 had been the primary international maritime rescue distress frequency since 1912. Uh, but as I said a moment ago, that's been slowly moved from down there. And mostly nowadays it's some with satellite communication and uh, turning digital and so on. Uh, so there's not the same same need for the, the lower frequencies. So the, the 495 to 505 segment became less and less used. In 2007, UK hams then um, got access to, to 501 to 504 kilohertz, uh, although that was with a, an NOV and uh, the, the power limit was 100 milliwatts, uh, but that was increased in 2009 and then also again in 2010. The, the power levels, you know, the, the sound, low, but um, to get that sort of a power out of an antenna at those frequencies takes quite a bit. And uh, there's there's no, well, there was really no commercial equipment available, except for some um, former maritime sets, which which were capable of, of being used on those frequencies. But a lot of the, the, the early guys experimenting would have just built their own equipment. Uh, so it's, it's probably one of the bands where there's, there's still a lot of homemade equipment in use, although there are one or two manufacturers now producing transverters and things like that. 
Now in 2008 then that the Belgium um, so they, they gained access to 501 to 504 as well with a five watt EI, EIRP. And you sort of slowly see where there's a, a standard coming together here. So in the following months and years then more and more European countries um, provided an amateur allocation in and around the 500 kilohertz uh, frequency. In 2008 then, um, the CEPT, one of the uh, CEPT meetings, the, the allocation was discussed and further negotiations then over the next few years uh, sort of settled on the, uh, the request to have 472 to 479 kilohertz to be made available. So in 19, or sorry, in 2012 then, uh, the World Radio Conference that was approved and uh, from then on, um, the frequencies between 472 and 479 were allocated to the amateur service on a secondary basis. Now, having said that, not all countries adopted the recommendation and there are still some mostly African and Eastern Asian countries who would still use the, the frequencies for maritime use and so on. Uh, I also believe there's some aircraft beacons on the, the, in and around the, that band as well. Uh, so if you look on your license, somebody, <laughs> anytime you, you fancy having a wee look, you'll see there's a, in, in the schedules at the back, there's, there's quite a long footnote for the 472 kilohertz band and it lists a number of countries where you're, you're not allowed to operate close to um, and specifically excluded from um, using the, uh, the band. So uh, that's just what's happening. I would imagine in years to come that the, the, the big, so those countries probably will also release the allocation over to uh, amateur use. Now the band's only seven kilohertz wide, so um, that, that straight away brings you really into to digital modes and uh, to CW, uh, but by virtue of the, <laughs> the width of the band, it needs to be narrow. Although I believe there's some Australian and American stations have had USB, or sorry, um, SM, I'm not sure, I, I sound correct, I think it's USB on on the low band, um, sort of contrary to the, the normally um, uh, ex expected lower side band, I guess about like 60 meters, but um, I believe there has been a few USB contacts, but they, they took um, uh, place um, many years ago, just when the the band was in its infancy uh, for amateur use. Uh, and nowadays, I don't think you'll find a, a voice signal at all. Uh, so most of the mode, digi modes are well suited to it. There's a, quite a bit of whisper. Uh, but it's only got a, a bandwidth of what, six or eight hertz for the tones, <laughs> nice and narrow. Um, FT8 is one of the modes that you will find down there as is JT9 and CW is probably the most popular. Uh, so that, that's just sort of works out or shows how the, the band split up. And the digi modes, they, they all have a dial frequency, which is the same, but uh, there's a, a sort of gentleman's agreement that, that different audio tones are used for the different modes um, to avoid interference with each other. But I'll, I'll cover that a wee bit more uh, in one of the other slides as well. Hey, right, this is a bit probably people are more interested in is how you actually get onto 630 meters. Um, what I use is an FT, no, don't, I use an IC7300. I've got a transverter, which I bought from a company in Australia after having uh, uh, an exchange with uh, the, the owner of the company. They actually make other electrical, electrical equipment. Uh, their, their, their main product line is not amateur radio gear, but um, the, the owner of the company is a very keen amateur. He's one of the, the founders of the, the sort of the 630 meter movement in Australia. And uh, he has uh, a very small production ongoing of, of transverters. So, uh, so we spoke to him and uh, we'll purchase a transverter. And uh, probably the most interesting piece of equipment is the, the bit on the right, uh, the upside down bucket with a lot of copper wire around it. Uh, that's a variometer, um, which is basically a large inductor, um, which loads the antenna to, uh, to get it to resonate on a, a low frequency. And you can see two coils of copper wire wound around that. They're, they're two separate coils, which are joined internally with a, another uh, former with another coil on it, which is, you'll see. Uh, and some of the, the coming up photographs and the, the handle at the side there that allows you to turn uh, rotate the inner coil within the outer coil uh, which can vary the inductance uh, there's a number of taps on the, the copper there uh, which allow you to tap, tap off uh, at different ranges of inductance just depending on what you need uh, it's very hit and miss and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll run through how the variometer was built and how we came to the, the conclusions um, as to what i needed for the different uh, with the different coils and mindings and so on. Uh, the radio I have, I have it wide banded, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment or two as today with the transverter. Um, the, the, the radio itself, actually I'll cover it now, the, the um, 7300, it will, if it's wide banded, 
go down as far as 472 kilohertz. And it's actually quite good at reception. Um, it has filters that you can go into the internal menus and there's filtering for the, the broadcast bands, which can be activated, which makes it actually quite useful as a receiver. Uh, I did try it <laughs> to transmit with it. Um, it puts out about 20 watts into dummy load, but uh, the only problem is when you look at the, the output, uh, there's a huge number of uh, harmonics and uh, the harmonics are large. Uh, so you would need a, a low pass filter, um, fairly specific in frequency uh, to, to use the set for transmit. Um, I reckon the 20 watts out of that, probably most of 20 watts is probably going into frequencies apart from, from 472. So um, I decided at that stage that I didn't really want to start building a, 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 an output filter. And I would rather um, invest in a transverter um, because to, to get a meaningful signal on the band, I wanted to put a wee bit of power out. Uh, so the transverter is also capable of um, amplifying the signal a wee bit. Most of the, the homemade kits and information you can find, um, they're, they're very low power outputs for, for um, transmitters for the, the band. So we shall just move on. Right, the antenna is the most important bit really, as far as I'm concerned for getting out. And uh, at low frequencies, the biggest problem with the de designing the antenna is just the sheer physical size of it. Uh, <laughs> to put it into context, a quarter wave ground plane uh, for 630 meters is going to be by 520 feet high, um, you know, so that's, that's large. <laughs> and you, you can see why the, the, the BBC, for example, have the, uh, the, the tower on an insulated base uh, to, to get a good signal out. Um, the dipole is not really an option because just because of the, how close you are to the ground, very, very compromised. Um, you know, you're going to have a dipole of 320 meters long, and that's going to be a, a, only a small fraction of a, a wavelength off the ground. Uh, which is going to have a, a tremendous effect on what's coming off it. Uh, so a shortened vertical or a top-loaded vertical is the norm. The top-loading adds capacitance, which reduces the loading required. Um, that, that, though, is, is okay to a point, but at some point that's going to become an issue too because you can end up with a very long um, top wire, which, again, then you have to think about guys for it and supports and then the weight of the copper wire. Uh, you know, the, the longer it is, the thicker the copper is going to have to be, and that then puts, a, puts an issue in what you're going to be pulling off the top of your, your master support. Uh, some operators will use an 80 meter or a, a top band dipole, and the short the connecting leads together, or well, the, the connector, short out the connector at the base of the, the antenna so that the, the feed up to the T becomes your vertical, and then the, the two parts of the dipole become the top loading. And uh, all those antennas, they all need some sort of a, a ground mat as well. Uh, so what I have done, uh, the first antenna I put up, I used a, a 160 meter top band, uh, yeah, top band inverted L and uh, a fairly large ground plane with some of the radios about 25, 30 meters long. And uh, what I'm using now though, I've, I've changed the antenna since then. I'm now using one of, uh, one of Callum, Mr. DX Commander's <laughs> 18 meter, um, I think he calls it a nebula multiband vertical, uh, which is it's resonant on 80 meters, but the, the loading coil and base loads it and uh, have a fairly extensive ground plane of about 60, I think there's 62 radials uh, running out from that. So uh, it seems to work okay. And I can adjust the, uh, the resonance um, using the variometer. Uh, the, the variometer is basically an antenna tuning unit, um, but you're dealing with fairly high voltages and you need to have fairly substantial changes in, <laughs> in inductance. Um, just because of the nature of the antenna. So yeah, your, your, your normal ATU that sits in the shack is, is well outside the capabilities of that. You can see a wee circuit diagram there, which just sort of shows the, uh, the, the electrical side of the, the variometer. Uh, you can just see you, you have a variable coil within um, two fixed coils and your, your coax coming in there, the outer's connected to ground and the, the inner's going through the, the inductors. I've lost my arrow. <laughs> Where's my arrow going? There it is, right. So I searched on the internet to try to find out a means of calculating the amount of inductance that I would need for a given antenna length. And I eventually came across several articles, um, <laughs> most of which contradicted each other. <laughs> but there, I did come across a website though, um, which is was it 472 kilohertz.org um, of the uh, uh, the, the proper um, information at the, the end of the um, presentation here. 
but th they have a huge resource of uh, just different bits and pieces gathered together from different amateurs over the world. And amongst them all, after uh, a lot of searching, I discovered an antenna simulator for small vertical monopoles. So that answered all my prayers. And uh, they, uh, they have to, there have to be assumptions being made unless you have some fairly um, expensive and um, equipment to, to measure things like ground loss and so on. You, you can't really get the exact figures, but um, they have obviously put together um, a lot of people's experiences and have come up with this. So uh, for my top band inverted L, they call it a lazy L antenna. Um, you have just this one, just one wire off the top. So the antenna height, I can, I could, uh, what I was able to get was 15 meters vertical and uh, a top load length of 25 meters. So that, that actually works out as more or less a quarter wave than top band. <laughs> so that's what I was using as a, as a top band um, antenna. So we'll put those figures in there anyway. And then you come to the ground loss, which is quite important at the low frequencies. Um, it has a lot more effect than it does on the, the higher frequencies. So they have a, a number of options there. So where I live, uh, there's a bit of farmland, scrofting land around and about. I've got a few trees in the periphery of the property and of a, a metal mast. Uh, with some VHF antennas, which is not that far away from where the, the big vertical is. So I went for average loss and uh, hit the go button and it came up there with uh, saying that I needed a, a loading coil of around about 425 micro henries. And uh, also a couple of interesting figures for the, um, <laughs> to, to get an, an EIRP of five watts, you need to put 63 and a half watts in. <laughs> so there's a lot of loss in the antenna system, but also quite interesting to a 5 watts EIRP e e is the antenna voltage, which is in the order of four kilovolts. Uh, so um, the, the antennas can bite. Um, there's a, have a few photographs at the end of, of things that happen as well, because you're, you're dealing just with uh, voltages and currents, which you, you maybe aren't just dealing with when you're working with some of the other bands and so on. So uh, the thing that struck me was just the amount of power that you needed to put into the system to, to get a relatively small power out. Um, I suppose the, but part of the fact of that is that the antenna is so, in, so inefficient, um, it doesn't have any, any gain, it's a, a negative gain, but um, there's definitely, yeah, definitely a few figures there to, to make you think. So that's the antenna we ended up with. Um, you can see the vertical there on the left. Right up at the top, there's like two guys come off uh, the, the, the topmost guys there, there to act against the, the very thin wire, which you can't really see, which is the top part of the L. Uh, it runs off horizontally across to the right. On the photograph on the right, you can just about see the wire. Um, it's sort of running up between the two black guys there, uh, up towards the sort of top, top left ish of the, the photo. That's the, the, top, the top wire coming off. Now, I ended up with changing the dimensions slightly. I discovered that I was able to get 17 meters of wire onto the, up onto the pole. It's an 18 meter pole, but I'm, I'm coming off at about 15 meters because of the, the flexibility of the top bit. It's just far too flexible. So I was only able to get 15 meters in a straight line, but I, I wound a number of turns around the first um, about two and a half, three meters of the, the pole. And that allowed me to get 17 meters in up to the point where the two guys are. So I ended up then with 22 and a half meters coming off that. And uh, that wire is very, very fine, um, just because of the, the amount of pull that it's going to have on the, the top of the antenna. Uh, but that, that's actually the reason why I'm now running just with a vertical without the top loading. Uh, during the winter months, uh, I did have to repair the fine wire several times after with a bit of a storm. Uh, so it's like everything else, it, it evolves as time goes on and um, seems to work just as well now, but I don't have the, uh, the other complication of having to go out and replace the, the top loading wire every few weeks after a bit of a storm. So, right, that's a, a slightly different circuit diagram. Uh, that's just showing the variometer. There's two different ways of building the variometer. The, the way I used the circuit diagram I use is on the one on the right. Uh, and that's mainly because it's easier to get a, a good earth uh, and connect into your, your ground radials uh, than it is with the one on the right. Uh, both of them apparently tune just as well. And uh, you can see there that the, the, the two earths, they're just connected actually by the wire. Um, in real life. And then you have the, the inductance coils and the, the variable bit in the middle on your way up to the, the driven element. And the way that all comes together then is to use a large bucket. Um, that is a bucket out of Halfords, which I use for washing the car. 
Um, there are actually a number of videos uh, on YouTube. Uh, there's one chap who's called Sound Escapes Me, Kevin Lockins, or Kevin Lockins. Um, he's very, he does nice videos. Um, I find that they're, they're quite easy and uh, easy to understand and he, he covers the things in a nice sort of chatty manner. And uh, apparently in America, these, these types of buckets are available quite cheaply because a lot of the, the restaurants and so on use them for multi or, um, catering packs of um, you know, ingredients used in the kitchens and so on. Uh, they're, I'm trying to think what it is, five gallons, five US gallons. And the big attraction to me was that the bucket's not particularly tapered, which makes it a bit easier to put the coils on. Uh, so <laughs> the wire is 1.6, just single core, enamel copper wire. Um, there's taps. You can see the taps there with the, there's a cochlear click. They're just made out of um, the chocolate block type electrical connectors with the insulation removed. And uh, there's a number of those. I wasn't quite sure. I knew roughly where I was going to be tapping off. And the belt and braces job of, it covers from about 200 micro hemis up probably to about 700. Uh, so I put a few taps where I thought it was probably going to have to be tapping off to, to get a figure of in and around the sort of four or 500 mark. The, uh, the white axle, it's just a bit of um, electrical conduit. And uh, there's a wee metal rod in the end just to turn it. I've actually changed that to plastic now because uh, anything close to the variometer at all tends to cause it to, uh, to change its in, in, inductance <laughs> or impedance. Um, so even on a wet day, everything changes. You have to go and tune it, re uh, re -tune it slightly. But I found out a plastic, uh, a plastic um, pipe, pipe thing in instead of the metal um, did cause the thing to be just a little bit, a, a little bit better at, uh, at keeping the, the, the state of tune. Um, right, I'll just go on to the inside of the thing. That's just looking inside the bucket. Uh, the smaller coil, you're just looking at it end on there. That's about a 75 millimeter normal downspout. Uh, just whatever was happening, it's just it was land about and uh, worked, worked out okay. So we went on to one of the impedance calculators and that was using, I think it was an 80 millimeter former. So I reckon 75 was close enough. We'll put an extra couple of turns on just for good measure. Um, you can see a couple of the connections there. You can see the, the green and white wire, that's just an earth connection between the antenna coming on at one side and the, uh, the connection across to the, uh, where the radios um, connect with the other. There's two wires inside. They're connecting the two outer coils um, through the, what's actually a double coil. Uh, you'll see in another photograph. In a moment, the, the inner coil is constructed. It's, it's actually one coil, but there's a space in the middle to allow the axle to go through. So uh, there's flexible copper wire then used just for the connections across. I put tag tag connectors on uh, just to make it easy to connect. Um, if you're if I was doing it again, um, I would probably uh, spend a wee bit more time with the internal connections and so on. Uh, but I, I do have a Mark II in production at the moment, but that's uh, something at the side at the minute because uh, it's quite a it's an interesting band because it really only comes alive during the winter months. There's not an awful lot happening at the moment. Uh, and up here in the north of Scotland, it doesn't actually get dark at this time of year. So uh, there's not really an awful lot to be heard. Uh, so I've sort of put it on the back burner for a couple of months. And um, we'll get the, uh, the new Mark II version up and ready for about September time uh, when the band starts to come back again. Right, that's somebody else's inner coil. I forgot to take a photograph of my own inner coil. So you can see just the, uh, the construction of it there. It's actually one continuous coil uh, because the wire runs across diagonally on the other side behind where it says 35 micro -Henrys, That on the other side of the bay, the wire continues between the top and bottom coils. You can just about see the, the cutout for the axle to go through. The wee copper screws there are the brass screws. That they're just there to, uh, to hold the wire in place. They don't serve any other purpose. There's, there's no electrical need for them to be there. And what I did, I actually used double-sided tape um, when I was winding my coils to try and hold it in place. So we, uh, right at the side there, um, this runs down. The sol solder tags are fitted at each end, uh, just to make it easy to connect onto the, uh, the two coils that are on, on the outside of the bucket. The coils all need to be worn the same way. Um, so when I was winding the coils on the bucket, they're all worn clockwise. So I marked the end of the, the, the inner coil and the coil was also worn clockwise inside that as well just so that whenever it's all put together, um, everything's all the same. Uh, because 
to, to vary the inductance, you're actually moving the inner coil, you're rotating the inner coil within the outer coil. So whenever you get to the, the, the full rotation um, of 180 degrees, the inner coil ends completely opposes to what the outer coil is. Uh, so uh, that, that doing it that way means that I know where the, uh, where the halfway mark is quite easily. And uh, to, to me, it makes sense. It would work okay the other way too, but it would, it would appear to be sort of upside down, if you know what I mean. Right, that's just a couple of pictures of the construction of the, the base. The, the copper wire, I thought, yep, great, 1.6 mil copper, nice and big, handy, easy to use, but that's actually quite tiring winding it. It has a, a mind of its own and needs a fair bit of pressure uh, just to get it to, to go tightly, uh, just to follow the contours of the bucket. So I ended up with four strips of double-sided tape to try and hold it in place um, because it had to be kept under tension the whole way too. Uh, so we we'll eventually managed to do it, but uh, definitely hard on the thumbs. Uh, to put on the taps, uh, ra rather than cutting the wire each time, I just wound it as one and I put a, a twist in um, wherever I thought I was going to be putting the taps. And they're just wound up two or three times and then I carried on winding. Um, what I did then, got the blowtorch out when I was finished and uh, just burnt the enamel off and we rubbed the sandpaper and uh, the, the chocolate block connectors went on. Um, of course, I cut the insulation off those once, once they were in place. Uh, because that, that means then they can put a crocodile clip on quite easily. It also means I've got two screws to secure them as well, uh, which uh, just sort of makes belt and braces. Now you can see a couple of connectors at the bottom of the bucket. The photograph on the left, that is a, um, which one's that? That's a earth connection for the radials. And the photo on the right bottom, that shows the PL259 where the coax comes in. And uh, there's also another connector there. Um, it's, it's black, but the, uh, that's where the um, connection for the uh, jumper up onto the, the, the connectors that you can see the tap points that goes in there. Probably would have been better with a different color, but it's not an earth connection. It's, it's, it's on the antenna side. Uh, the, the center point, the PL259 is actually connected to that end of end. And there's a wire runs from the, one of the mounting lugs on the, the PL259 across to the earth connection on the other side of the bucket. Right, there's another photograph of the inside. Um, you, you can see the connections there. The, uh, the trick with the inner coil was to have it's mounted on the axle and then you've got flexible wire between the, the two coils. And the, the trick there is to have the wire just, just cut to the right length so that it's coming tight when the coil is rotated through 90 degrees each way. And that, that gives you an indication that you've got your maximum, maximum amount of tune. And you start to back off a wee bit if you think you're going too far. Once you go over centre, you're just going to wrap the wire around the axle. So um, again, I haven't put any end stops or anything in. The, the less I put in closer to the coil, the better as far as I was concerned. So you do get to feel it and uh, it, it actually is it's quite easy. And now, now that I have the handle on the outside too, um, I know where the handle is in relation to the coil inside. So it all, it all makes sense to me anyway, as to where the, the coil is in relation to the outer coil. Uh, the right hand coil then shows uh, uh, the first sort of <laughs> temporary setup. Um, the antenna's coming off the, just at the very top, the, the lug coming in on the black wire. That's the, the wire going up the, the mast, that's the antenna wire. The blue banana plug, that's just linked around to the crocodile clip. You can see centre right onto one of the, the taps. Uh, so that's how the, the upper part's connected. Um, you need to, depending on, on what your antenna is, you, you just up and down the taps with an antenna analyzer on the system to, uh, to, to get it. Very much trial and error. And I must have spent, a, I'm sure it was at least one Saturday afternoon um, trying to get it. There's a lot of combinations. So I think of seven, seven taps on one of the coils and eight taps on the other. There's a lot of combinations. And uh, we got it close a few times, but eventually we got the sweet spot and uh, it all started to come together. Right, that's the bottom end of the antenna. You can see the coax coming in there. And uh, it's only a big long plug because of the, I think of an end type on the end of the, the cable I was using, so we'll have an adapter. But uh, the blue banana plug then, that's the antenna feed. It's the live coming off the, the center of the, the coax. That's going up then onto one of the taps and then uh, on up through the coil to, to the, the top and the, the top half. And uh, the thing was just set at the bottom of the mast there. Uh, you can see it in the right hand side there. Uh, it's very, very much a Heath Robinson um, setup. 
Somebody asked me what the board was with the degrees marked on it. That was just when I was, I used that for putting up the, of a couple of different portable masts. And that just gives me the, the angles for the guys. If I want three guys or four guys, I was just happened to be lying there. So the ferryometer, all constructed, connected up in a very much a Heath Robinson manner. And we spent a fair bit of time with the antenna analyzer, but eventually we managed to get 1.06 at 474.3 kilohertz, uh, to which I was delighted. And uh, on further analysis there, we're getting 52.8 ohms, so that's okay. Uh, not going to get much better than that. So that made it all worthwhile when it finally came together. It did take a wee while and I was starting to worry a bit <laughs> that everything was okay. But um, no, it definitely worked well. So that was the stage then we went back inside again and started to, to look at the, the transceiver and uh, get everything working to, to actually get on air and put a signal out. Right, that's the transverter. Uh, it's Roger VK4YB, owns the, the company that makes uh, electrical equipment. So uh, send them an email. And we'll actually exchange quite a few emails discussing different things about 630 meters. Excuse me, let's get us up here. And he's done quite a lot of experimentation over the years. He's just one of the, the moving men, or main men, moving motivating factors, whatever you want to call it, um, on 630 in Australia. Uh, so eventually persuaded me to buy one of those transverters. So um, I, well, I have been looking for a transverter, but uh, as uh, with him being so interested in the band, um, he's designed it. Uh, with some very nice filtering and they're, they're also very, very stable. Uh, so uh, we've, we've gathered up a few bits of surplus equipment here and uh, we managed to, to raise the price of a transverter, get it shipped over from Australia. And I'm well pleased with it, very nice indeed. Um, the SWR varies a wee bit from time to time, so we got it set up anyway. And I, I, what I did discover was if I'm standing beside the antenna and you get it set at one point, whatever it is, as soon as you walk about two or three meters away from the antenna, it changes. So that um, your body obviously has an effect, as as does the dog walking past, or the difference between a wet day and a dry day. I can it can change the SWR by maybe you know between one point one to, to maybe one point eight, one point nine. Uh, very occasionally, it's crept up over two, and I've had to wander out in the middle of the middle of the night and change the <laughs> change the variometer just to, to bring it back down again. Uh, but there I have just have a couple of notes here that uh, I think I've covered it already that I, I tried some uh, tests with the 7300 to see if I could get it to transmit, but um, I wasn't overly happy. Uh, I have heard one or two people who have built filters for them, but um, I think it's asking a lot of the, the radio because it's not really designed to transmit at those frequencies. Uh, so I don't know in the long term, I have a suspicion that that may not be good for it. But anyway, that's the transverter. And you can see there when we've got it all connected up, um, Input five watts, drive it from top band, five watts in, and that uh, we're getting 50 or there about watts out. Um, you can put a wee bit more, it will run up to about 60 watts, uh, which is putting out just under five EIRP at the antenna. And that uh, was quite happy with the SWR at 1.2 to 1. Uh, so all the antenna connected with about 25 meters of coax, and uh, nobody, nobody close to the antenna affecting the, uh, <laughs> the, the impedance. Right, now one of the problems with getting a transverter from somebody in Australia is that their top band allocation is slightly wider than ours. Um, so my 7300 fortunately is, top, is wide banded <laughs> because the, the IS is slightly below the, the UK amateur allocation. Uh, so 1.08, no 1.804.2 gives you 474.2 out and 474.2 is the, uh, the, the all important frequency where it all happens uh, for the digital modes. Um, CWA up and down the band a wee bit, but all the digital modes all, all operate on a, a dial frequency of 474, 200. And for those of you, probably most of you are, are, have experienced Whisper or FT8 or some of those, you're feeling an audio tone in of different frequencies. So the, the agreement to the, with the users of the band is that, well, Whisper, you're, you're tied with um, 200, 200 hertz each side of 1500. Uh, so that, that's that one fixed. But FT8, normally you've got a fairly good range to play with. So normally an FT8, um, keep the, the tone sort of down below about 900. 
and that means that you're you're well below the whisper frequency. So the guys running whisper can run away with the whisper, and you can be doing FT8 just slightly below them, and that you're not going to cause any interference. Yet the dial frequency is still the same, and you're you're not going to cause too much interference to any CW users and so on. So it's an interesting uh, way to do it all, but it's, it's amazing what can be squeezed into seven uh, seven hertz. And the bottom one just shows the range of the transverter there. It's just covers the whole band uh, just with that change in the input frequency. Uh, it all works very well. And the transverter has a lot of protection devices built in. Um, you, you drive it too hard, it cuts out. The SWR is too high, it cuts out. Um, it gets too warm, it cuts out. <laughs> so uh, it's quite, quite good. A number of screens you can go through. And it's all very simple to use. So the, the modes that I would tend to use, I'm, I'm not really a CW man, I haven't used it in earnest for a long time. And uh, I've always been interested in data modes from the, the days of teleprinters and so on. So we tend to run Whisper and FT8 at the moment. And during the winter months, um, I would have normally set the, the whole station up before I went to bed just to run Whisper overnight because that's when the, the best signals are going to happen. And that's a Whisper plot, um, 10th of 11th of February. The red stations, the red dots, are stations that I have received. Uh, the green ones are stations that have received me, and the ones are, which are move purpley colored are the ones where they both are and received each other. So the antenna there is that's the top band um, inverted L loaded with the variometer, running about five watts. No, 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 it's probably running about two watts EIRP. I tend to keep the power down for whisper and uh, only drive it at about five or six, maybe not even, probably about four watts going in. Um, but that uh, shows you the, the, the sort of propagation. Um, and, and <laughs> on FT8, I haven't worked across the Atlantic yet on FT8. We can, we can run the power a wee bit higher, up to about five watts output uh, EIRP. Um, but there's so few stations on. Um, most of the contacts you have are actually by SCED. Uh, he's at ON4KST, he, he runs the, uh, the chat website, uh, very good for arranging skids for others on the band. But over the winter months, uh, the whisper's running every night. When you get to daytime, all you get is half a dozen UK stations and uh, nothing else. It all disappears again, it's just like medium wave. <laughs> Radio 1 comes up, you know. But um, during the night time, um, it all changes and that's actually quite interesting where you can get across to. I was surprised just how many stations are on the band the first time I actually put a receiver on it. Uh, that's another whisper plot, uh, just for a, another day. That's using a website run by VK7JJ. He's um, another station in Australia who's very much into this. And it's an alternative to PSK Reporter. And you just go in, you put in your details, your band, call sign, uh, number of hours that you're wanting to get a report for. And again, that gives you a, a visual representation of the stations that you've worked. So nothing across the Atlantic in that one, but uh, good smattering across the, the, the you know, Central Europe anyway. And I think once you get to, um, once you get sort of beyond the, the, the former Soviet Union, I think there's, uh, the, the reason you don't get many stations, it's not because there's not people there, it's just not, there's, act, it's just not, there's many active amateurs on the band. I don't think it's really to do with propagation. The stations, um, anybody you talk to who's interested, uh, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of interest and you've also you're, you're getting once you get over towards turkey and so on you're getting close to the countries that don't allow the operation of the band and they were close to their borders so that also has an effect <coughs> excuse me but it would be actually quite nice if some of the further eastern stations were able to use the band just to see how the propagation worked out um, going over to the east so what i have noticed on top band and 80 meters across to the states so I'm quite a bit of whisper here, <laughs> and um, the uh, the propagation it can be one way at certain times of the day, which is quite interesting. And I, I put it down to the absorption of the D layer, um, which is, uh, is, is still relevant to stations over to the west. Um, yet with ourselves, um, we, we're operating without it, so the signal tends to bounce up and back down again, whereas their signal going up tends to get absorbed. So it will be interesting to see if that happened. Over the east, but because there's so few stations over there, I can't really see if it happens on uh, on six thirty meters. Right, that's uh, that's the up to date version of the, the antenna, and the variometer is now inside a weatherproof box. It was fine sitting on the ground on a nice day, 
<clears throat> but uh, any time the rain came anywhere near at all, everything changed dramatically. So I was down in, in Inverness one day in B&Q and there's for 20 quid, we've got the plastic wood effect city garden storage box. So I thought that was great. Nice price. And uh, just a nice, easy flip pins lid on it. So it's now at the base of the, uh, the antenna. Uh, the antenna is not fully complete now. There's only three elements on it. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, the 80 meter one was the first one to go on, and uh, the, the variometer was connected up quite quickly. I have a common mode choke at the end of the coax. Uh, the coax I have, it's, um, it's low loss, very, as in very under the ground, very thin, uh, which is suitable for direct burying. It's got a copper foil and also a, a, a water sort of repellent layer. Uh, so that the antenna comes down and it's, it's terminated at a common mode choke. Uh, just because I don't want the antenna cable to become part of the radio system. Uh, it does get used for other experiments from time to time as well. So uh, that's why it's, uh, I know 10, 10, 10, 10 mil cable seems a bit excessive for, for low band, but um, it's uh, it's used for VHF sometimes as well. So that's why it's there. But I said, oh, it just comes up inside the box uh, from the shack. So it's not over the ground. It's not going to get walked on or driven over or animals eating it or anything and uh, just connected onto the antenna there. For anybody that's interested, that's just with the sort of cut through of the uh, the cable. Um, I think Martin Lynch and Sons sell it. I think that's where I got it from. At a price, I have to say, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a one-off job. It's in there for a long time. <laughs> so uh, it's got the, the, the jelly layer, um, thrown in jelly, uh, and then around the braid there, just to prevent any of the braid oxidation. Uh, just on the right there, you, you can see the uh, the variometer sitting inside the plastic box. I've now got a board there um, with a couple of switches on it. So if I want to switch the variometer in or out, it's only a matter of turning two switches. And that's the, the antenna and it's a multiband vertical. Or if I click the variometer in, that's it. And it's a uh, 630 meter vertical. Uh, so a future plan may see um, electric relays put in to uh, facilitate the changeover, but at the minute I have to put the coat on on a wet winter's night and go down the garden and took two switches if I want to go on to uh, 630 metres. Right, we have a few scary photographs here. Um, the, the voltage can be quite high at times and uh, it has been discovered by a number of people that what is an insulator at 80 metres or 40 metres isn't necessarily an insulator at uh, 630 metres. So the, a couple of these pictures are, are Rogers from Australia. The first one is a wire he had over a branch of a tree and they, over a, a, a winter, the, the insulation got rubbed and uh, it actually burnt through the branch and that's the, that's the wire after they burnt through the branch and it come down to rest against the trunk of the tree which had also started to burn. Uh, so that's quite interesting. The, the middle one at the top, that's a Dalrin insulator. Apparently Dalrin no longer becomes an insulator at 630 metres. Uh, so that's what happens with that. The third one at the top, that's just a, a coil where the, there's been a, bre a breach of insulation. And uh, apparently it seems to happen quite regularly at the, the lower frequencies. So it uh, hasn't happened to me yet, but it's something I'm, I'm definitely aware of. Bottom left, that's another one where the, the cable was resting against the point of the nut. And uh, over a period of time, the, the RF got out. Something similar happened to the one with the red coil there. And the uh, bottom right, that's a TP stintillator, um, which I presume just wasn't designed for <laughs> the part that was going through it. Uh, I'm not quite sure what power was going through it, but um, certainly it failed anyway. So that's, uh, that's what can happen. Right, that's about it. Um, I've just got a, there's one page here. Um, I'll just run down quickly through these. You're probably familiar with some of them. This is where I got some of the information. Um, there's not a lot of commercial equipment available. Uh, there's a lot of us still homemade. Um, although there are a couple of companies making transverter kits nowadays. Uh, I've heard of somebody who has a Nikon IC706, not a 705, but a 706, which they have converted to run on the band directly without a transverter, although it's putting out low power. The problem with a lot of the transverter kits that are available, they're all very low power, only putting out a few hundred milliwatts, which is fine for um, if it's fine for whisper, but it's not really good for, for two-way communication. Um, I find even even with um, you know, running the my full almost five watts, 
that um, the FT8 contacts we've had, they're, they're, they're good enough, but um, you do need that wee bit of power. The band's very noisy. Uh, there's, there's quite a quite a bit of noise down there. There's also a lot, a lot of broadcast band interference just above and just below, which can be an issue uh, sometimes. But uh, that's top site, 472 kilohertz.org. It's a huge information of, of resources from all over the place. Uh, the indexing systems is it's a wee bit haphazard, but uh, very, very good just for, for getting information and links to other, other people who maybe know a bit more. Right, the second one down there, and that's the YouTube, um, KB9RLW, Kevin. Uh, he, he does a number of videos for different things, but he has a very nice, very clear uh, and concise uh, video about building a bucket variometer. And I watched that a lot of times <laughs> and took screenshots from it and standing out in the garage measuring bits to, to see if they're the same as what he had. And uh, very, very useful indeed. <clears throat> right, WSJTX, probably most people are aware of that. There's another version called GTDX, which is a, it's a knockoff of it. WSJTX is, is, is um, publicly available. So GTDX is another version and it's very similar. It does the same sort of thing. Personally, I prefer WSGTX. Uh, I think it's just because I've used it right from the start and I'm, I'm familiar with it. Now, if you, you PSK Reporter and uh, WSPRD.VK7JJ, they're both data reporting sites. Um, you can use them. Well, PSK Reporter also works with FT8 and many other data modes. Uh, you go ahead and put in your, your, your mode and your call sign and your band, and it'll tell you where you've been heard and who's all the rest of it. Um, BK77, he's really just for whisper, which is the weak signal packet reporting. And uh, again, I would just leave it running overnight. I'll go and check in the morning and see who's heard me and see who I've heard. And it could just run away while you're in bed. <coughs> Excuse me, too much talking. The last bit of software which I use to tie everything together is Grid Tracker. Um, it's, it's like a, a mapping type software, but it interfaces with WSGTX and also most of the popular logging software programs. And that takes the data signal from WSGTX and puts it into visual form on a map on your computer screen and also then writes it to your log. And that, that is very useful. Um, I like that one too, because you can leave it running in the shack and come out and have a look and you can just see straight away where the, the activity may be or where it may not be. And uh, it's nice too, just ties it all in together. So I think I've covered everything there. Hopefully um, I've maybe given you a wee bit of information and uh, something to maybe encourage one or two people to, uh, to venture further down the bands and see what's there. So I'll hand it back to yourself, Nick. Hey, brilliant. Thank you very much, John. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, your very scary pictures of the uh, damage that several kilovolts <laughs> can potentially uh, can, can potentially create. Uh, it's, it's also a good idea to turn it off when you go to adjust things because um, with, with running Whisper, if you you know Whisper, it has a sort of random transmit period. And uh, I was out adjusting it one day and it decided to transmit because I hadn't turned it off. And it definitely you get a wee job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, I can imagine. Um, okay, well, John, that was a really, it was fascinating. So thank you very much. Right, I'm going to chuck it open to to questions from the floor. Who wants to who wants to go first? Yes, Russell. Thanks for a really interesting talk there. I, I wonder you, you're using FT8. I wonder if you've tried the. Um, there's a a couple of new modes, aren't there, in WSG? There are Q65. No, there's another one, isn't there? FST W, 4W, or something four, like that? 4S, yes, yeah. yes, right, yes. Uh, yeah, I've actually tried both of those. Okay. Um, but only really on a local basis. Um, there's a number of some, on a Thursday night up in the north of Scotland, we'll have a whisper night on different bands. Um, <laughs> cool. So uh, we we'll, we'll, we'll tried the, the sort of the newer version of, of, uh, um, WSPR um, well, yeah. a, few, a few months ago, but um, we, we tried different timings and you know different. You, you, you've, you can up to up to about five minutes, I think, for the tr transmit period. And, yeah, it's um, very slow. Yeah, but and, and it works very well, but um, it's just purely the lack of stations on. I think it's the problem. Um, right. It doesn't really seem to have caught on, and I think yeah. Q, Q65, which is sort of 
I know saying that the VHF and above, it seems to be the same up here. There's a handful of us have tried it, but I've had about four or five contacts on six metres randomly, and, and outside of that, there's nothing. So again, oh, I, don't think, I don't think it's caught people's imagination, but they are yeah. nice foods, you know. Yeah. It's, that's re really, really very interesting what you've, uh, what you've got there. Um, it's, a, it's a band I've considered having a little bit of a play with, but yeah, I haven't been brave enough yet. <laughs> But most most of the, the SDR um, trans, transmit receivers, you know, like your seventy three hundreds and the, the DX tens and so on, yeah, they, they'll all receive quite happily down there. So even, even if you and um, I've, I've I have friends who'll just plug an eighty meter dipole in, and uh, there's enough coming in that they'll be able to you know start receiving anyway. You can receive something, yeah. You, you can have a look and see what traffic's there. Uh, yeah. So there's a wee, wee bit of FT eight, a uh, wee bit of JT nine. Um, so cool. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, Russell. Anyone else with a question or comment to John? Roger. Oh, hi, John. Thanks for that. Fascinating, that. Um, you've answered most of my questions. I was thinking of, like, would the weather affect it and things like that. Um, I spotted the chopping board insulator that you've slid in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wondered, because of all the power loss in the coil and everything, does anything get warm? Does anything get heat hot? Or does it um, fairly well separate? Not not really, I think probably because of the gauge of wire that I've used. Um, you know, so it's fairly heavy gauge at 1.6, so uh, any heat that's going to build up is sort of more or less dissipated. And by the time it gets down through the coil, you know, there's obviously a bit lost in the coil, but with it being outside, um, I haven't really had an issue. And I've never been close enough to it when I've been transmitting anything in earnest uh, to actually go and feel anything. So, uh, although I do, I do notice the SWR does change. It'll, it'll change maybe from 1.6, 1.7 up to maybe 2, 2.5 over the course of an hour if I'm doing FT8. So you need to go out and adjust it so that, you know, yes, there, there is heat generated, but not, not to the point of melting anything that I've, I've seen yet. So, Right. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, anyone else with a question or comment to John? Who else is? Anyone else waving at me? I can't. I'm trying to look between two screens here. Ian, uh, fear of embarrassing myself. Um, what are the characteristics of the six hundred and thirty meter band? As I've never been any further down than eighty. Right, um, it's it's very much a, a nighttime band for anything of interest. Um, during the day, it acts very much like the medium wave, where you you've got ground wave propagation. So um, there's a, there's one station in the south of England I get up here. Um, G zero MRF, I think it is. He must have an absolutely superb antenna system because he's always a good signal no matter what the time of day is. But outside of that, there's, there's a couple of stations in Scotland also transmitting and I'll hear them during the day. I'll not hear anything else until it starts to get dark. Once it gets dark, then Eastern European will be the, the range over to the east. I think that's mostly due to the fact that there's nobody further east than that actually on the band. But um, the states in Canada, you'll get the east coast of the states in the Canada coming in at sort of two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I'd say it's very much a nighttime band, and uh, that sort of ties in with what you get on the, the normal me medium wave broadcast band. Yeah, once once it gets dark, you're aware of all the stations from the further away starting to come in. Does, does that sort of answer the question? Yep, that's grand. Thank you very much. I'll I'll have a listen. You let me know when you're on, and I'll see if I can hear you. From from about September, most nights I, I normally have it running from about ten o'clock at night, just right through to breakfast time. So. And uh, the, the, the longer the night, the longer it'll be on. You, know, you, you get to November, December, I'll, I'll try to have it on from sort of about tea time. Grant, thank you very much. Okay. Good, good question, Ian. Um, right, anyone else with a, a question or comment to John? Yeah, Gerald. You're on mute, Gerald. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the button. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, John. It was it was really interesting. I'm sorry I missed the first little bit. My computer wouldn't uh, log on. It was just connecting and never getting anywhere. But I, I caught most of the late uh, most of it after that. And uh, a question I'd ask to ask you is: um, back in the '60s, I used to experiment a bit with one top band, 160 meters, and I found it was better to have most of the loading coil near the top. Because the it raised the current portion further up the up the yep, mast. Yeah. Uh, any experiments on that line? Um, I haven't. I didn't think about it, but uh, certainly going by other people's experiences, I think the size of the loading coil probably, and unless you have a, a very substantial mast, I think the consensus is that the loading coil is better at the bottom, and to get 
just the, the height of it, just because of the sheer mass of it and the, the amount of inductance that's needed to, to deal with the, uh, I suppose, the weight of it, you know, the, the, the gauge of the wire needed to deal with the power going through it. Um, to me, anyway, there's an engineering problem with it being at the top, you know. Uh, but yes, I, ideally, I suppose, in an ideal world, it would be better at the top rather than the bottom. Yeah, okay. The other way I thought I was wondering, I was bringing the top part lowered down from the top to a loading coil, which was near the ground, well, a few feet above ground, and then another piece of wire going up from there to do the final connection, final loading. Yeah, that would, that would work too. But it's, it's, it's very much an experimental bit. You know, I, I started off with the, the inverted L for top band and used that. And so I'm now on the vertical and uh, I've been looking at, at other alternatives for next month or two, but uh, space is also a limitation for, it's okay going up the ways, but um, for, for ground planes, I, I have a ground plane at the minute, uh, some of the wires are maybe 30 metres long for the ground plane, uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of space needed for it, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely food for thought. The ground plane's bigger than my garden and house together. No. Well, thank you very much, John. Over to you. <laughs> no, no, you're welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, super talk, uh, John. Uh, we're really pleased. Second time around, Kevin, you didn't fall asleep, no? <laughs> no, no, I didn't fall asleep. I lost my internet for a while. I don't know why. It suddenly come back up. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're just about understanding it now after the second time. So so maybe when I've heard it, you know, when you've been around a few other clubs, <laughs> heard it another half a dozen times, we might be getting there. Well, next time next time you're up here, call in, I'll show it to you. It'll make more sense then when you actually see it, probably. <laughs> well, exactly, because we're supposed to be, I know Phil and I are supposed to be putting up a um, the same mast as you in his back garden. Right. Uh, so that should be a laugh. Yeah. No, let's see. Give us a shout if you're up this way. Not a problem. Well, it won't be this year, uh, John. It'll be next year. I'll be well. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, yeah. good luck with the uh, uh, with the lighthouse and the castles. Well, that's that's if it goes ahead. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> well, I just have to wait and see. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks very much for that. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, right, anyone else with a question? Yeah, Jeff. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much, John. Very interesting, and this is uh, um, this is something I remind from my younger ages when I was a short wave listener, and I remember I was doing medium wave and long wave dixing, mm -hmm. and I uh, I made for reception I made a kind of a frame one meter by one meter with a lot of windings mm -hmm. and some C's on that, and then I could tune through the band. So I and, and it was turnable, so you could uh, null out certain stations and and you know and peak other stations. So I'm just wondering if that would work in connection with you know. It probably uh, would. It probably would because I know in years gone by, very variometers were actually available commercially uh, for some of the yeah. old valve. You know the, the, the old valve manufacturers would have produced a, a variometer which would have allowed that, a very similar sort of thing to null out some frequencies and some stations just to tune the antenna for the, the frequency and. It was needed so yeah i probably would have i have seen large in fact that chap kevin who did the video for which you know showed me the, the building of the barometer he made a large um loop antenna yeah uh, with a, a number of um coils uh, around a wooden framework for, for one of the lower i'm not yeah. sure if it was for 630 might have been for 220. I had that. Um, I had that in the living room. I had that yeah, in the living room. So My wife was not that happy, so but was probably about a meter and a half to two uh, meters in diameter. Yes, yeah, yeah, something like yeah. that. Uh -huh. So yes, yeah. yeah, so, uh, the same sort of thing. I think would work okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, to begin with experimenting, that would be a good idea. And then the second question: um, Do you use the digital modes Whisper 15 and QRSS, which is QRSS, which is slow, very slow CW? It takes maybe ten or fifteen minutes. I haven't done, that. but the, the, I haven't. But the, the, the newer, and I can I can never remember the designation of it. It's WS something something S. <laughs> the, yeah, which Bill yeah. Taylor produced about I'll be maybe at the beginning of the year. You can run it. And I think there's, there's a six or seven minutes. In fact, um, yeah, it's, it's the long one, and, but it's very very slow. But it just it, slow. but you're getting reports of minus fifty d. Well, minus forty dB. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's incredible, can, yeah. incredible what it can pull out of the noise. But um, I haven't seen that used. As I say, norm, just a normal whisper too. Um, you know, with, okay. the, with the two, the two minute seems to be the one that so many people use, and I think it's just yeah. being carried on because so many people are set up for it. 
Yeah. yeah. But certainly some of, some of the newer modes are, are really good at getting them out of a, a weak, weak signal. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, I, I, I know that some people in Belgium here, when they were on the 500 KC uh, or 500 plus KC frequencies, that they were using this um, QRSS and this Whisper 15, which, which right. takes 50, 50 minutes. Uh -huh. Well, well, what you find, you, you do hear odd signals, and you know, I, th I think because of the nature of the band, if you maybe get two yeah. or three um, amateur friendly, they'll, they'll try something between themselves, because I know there's some of us up here in the north of Scotland, we, we do a couple of experiments on our own, and, you know, it's, it's all arranged beforehand, and yeah. you're down on a frequency using one of the modes, and unless somebody else knows you're there, you're, you're probably not going to come to their attention, but, um, you know, so it's still, I, I quite enjoy the fact that it's still sort of a, very much an experimenter's band, you know, and this, the people that are down there, they're, they've they obviously put a bit of effort into actually getting there. Um, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's nice. It takes me back a bit to the old days. <laughs> by, by the way, I think uh, the fact that uh, medium wave transceivers and even long wave transceivers are closing down all over Europe and also in the UK, um, that opens a lot of opportunities for those who are in broadcast DXing, yeah. because well, now you can very well hear the Americans, the Canadians, and so on and so on. It does. You can definitely hear more at night now. Yeah. It's not the same, the same big signals coming off the BBC yeah. transmitters, yeah. And I can imagine that they mix that they are mixing with your frequencies more or less. Some station, if you are yeah. very near to a medium wave station, yeah. The f f filtering is the key. Um, down there, there's there's a lot of big signals very close, just yeah. above and below. So, yeah. you know, and that that that's before you come. There's, there's still some maritime signals down there too, which are quite strong. Mm -hmm. And there's I've, I've heard a couple of beacons, which I believe are. Um, to do with um, for, for air, aircraft, and yeah. they are they can be very very strong and very very wide if they're there, but they're not and there all yeah. the time. So, and know. Navtex Navtex is still on the five eighteen and four nineteen. That's right, now that it would be yes <laughs> down there too. <laughs> I have so such a station seven kilometers from me. Yeah, right. That's, that could Quite be a strong. problem. I'm fortunate. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm fairly I'm fairly fairly far away from both things here. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Very you're interesting. Welcome. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, right. Anyone else with a, a question or comment to John? If not, uh, John, can I thank you very much, and can we can we show our appreciation to John in the in the normal way? So thank you, John. Really enjoyable. Thank you, thank you John. Thanks very much for, for asking me along. I'm delighted when the, Kevin suggested it. You know, so uh, yeah, no problem at all. And ho hopefully, we might see somebody down there. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's life, life below top band. <laughs> yeah, I loved your comment, John. It's very much an experimenter's band, and it clearly is from yeah. from what you're doing. Someone in the chat put up a, I think it was you, Russell, put yes. up a, um, a YouTube video of a, a full size 630 meter doublet. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> it'd be nice to have the space to do that. I have a, I have a feeling that's why it's the, the band's so. Um, so well followed in Australia because most of the guys there mm. seem to live in the middle of nowhere and they've got the, a huge the, amount of space. This guy's in New Zealand and he's yeah. uh, it's just in a forest. Three twenty meters that way. Three twenty meters that way. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, John, thank you, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, contribution. It was uh, as I said to you at the start of the meeting. Um, we've covered so many different aspects of the hobby in the year or so we've been running these weekly meetings and, and this is one we haven't touched on so it was, it was great to have you tonight. Thanks John. Glad to have done a service. <laughs> okay. I know, say yeah. 73 to everybody. All right. Thanks for coming John. Really okay. good. All the best. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Cheers John. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Cheers now. Thanks. <laughs> Safe journey home John. Uh, don't need to go too far. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>